I think that we accidentally asked Anna Marie Cox to like sign over the rights to her DNA to us. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what all those cloning booths are that, for in the yeah. back room? Yeah, okay, we got I was, big plans. I was wondering it was in this, those giant tubs of goo. This is, and this is Anna our, Marie Cox's. This is our version of Living Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to a bonus segment of Market Moves, your favorite source for all the information about money, stocks, bonds, trading, etc. So we've, uh, here at Market Moves, we have been the target of some spurious criticism Untrue. that we are biased, we are right-leaning, we are uh, only slightly to the left of piracy, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, to help balance things out, if that's even something we need to do, we would love to uh, now uh, have a big Market Moves welcome for the hosts of the offline podcast, liberal commentators John Favreau and Max Fisher. Uh, welcome to the welcome to the Market Moves uh, program, gentlemen. Hey, uh, big fan, big fan of Market Moves. <laughs> well, it, it, we, we're you're joining us on a on a uh, on the perfect day. Uh, Ron DeSantis has recently announced that he will be joining Elon Musk, uh, and together they will be announcing uh, Ronald. It, it's, I'm close with him, so I can call him. Yeah, Ronald. right. Ronnie. Ronald's uh, Ronald's uh, presidency, his his chase for the presidency, his uh, presidential campaign, as it were. Uh, gentlemen, Lucas Matson and Jared Menken are Elon Musk and Ron DeSantis. <laughs> <laughs> I I can see that. I see. I think the question of who Jared Menken is is actually a really interesting one. And I hear people yeah. looking for like, oh, is he DeSantis? Is he Howley? Is he Tom Cotton? And like, I always felt very clear to me who he is, which is he is the exact person that I have always heard every democracy watchdog like professional say they are most worried about, which is a like Donald Trump demagogue plus a far right YouTuber. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like a sm yeah, he's a smarter Donald. He seems smart. He's a smarter, ruthless. I don't know that he seems all that charismatic. Like, I, I, yeah. it was that speech on election night where he was, uh, it's a little. It, was, it, didn't, it didn't move you? It, hearing about like, the purity of I the land? I like feel American, fasci <laughs> American fascism is very, like, Donald Trump, fa you know, true, yeah, brand. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I feel yeah. like. Jared Mankin's brand there is a little, it's He's, a little I, much. I have listened, unfortunately, to a lot of far-right YouTubers and a lot of, like, his sighting of, like, Thomas Aquinas and oh. St. Augustine, that's, like, very, like, <laughs> Mike Cernovich, like, Robert Spencer. And anyway, this is not us exactly bringing the pod to the left. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he definitely does feel like somebody that Esquire would have interviewed in 2016 and called like an interesting alt right figurehead. Right, right. Well, right he's right, a fire. Right. He's a firebrand. He's a he's right. he's dressed he's stylishly, brand. guys. He's a, he's so a bomb edgy. thrower. Yeah. He's a bomb thrower. The complex message of Jared Menken. <laughs> 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 Um, what was that line in the Times? The cool kids philosopher. They cool, said yeah, that's Ben Shapiro. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I think there's a touch of Ben Shapiro in there. Uh, Max, how would how would Maggie Haberman cover Mencken? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> Menken, Menken would be calling Maggie every seven minutes. Would be just all. He would not be able to walk past Maggie's cubicle without saying it. Should be on the phone. You'd be like, "Oh, it's Menken, isn't it?" And he would just be offloading some just like crazy inner gossip that she would then put into the newspaper. Yeah. There's an interesting moment in this uh, latest episode where uh, Ken tells Rava that she's too online. Two online, I guess because she cares about her kids, which I've, I've always thought of as a weakness. Definitely um, weakness. Yeah, your thoughts on, on, on Rava being too online or the criticism in general of being too online? Yeah, it's funny because I think too online is the type of criticism you level towards someone when they're, it's meant to say that you're not really in touch with reality, right? That, that your reality is just the Twitter conversation. And what's right. funny about Kendall using it is he's so far removed from reality mm -hmm. and the I mean the whole all of them are the, every season right and it's like this is this that episode was the first time we've seen sort of the real world effects of the shit they've been pulling right. happening all around mm -hmm. them so it is very funny that he accuses his ex-wife of being too online it actually it reminded me of like late 2016 when Trump was you know 
both nearing and then had won the election where I feel like a lot of people were telling me I was too online because it would be mm-hmm. like, hey, when this happens in other countries, like here are the things that happens and here's how it goes. And everybody's like, oh, you're being hysterical. And like, what was the line? Take him, take him literally, literally not, but seriously. not seriously. Yeah. yeah. This, yeah. yeah Selena Zito. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but there was, <laughs> it also reminded me of the period between the election and, uh, and the insurrection. Uh, yeah. how, how could we forget yeah. about that when everyone was like, Oh, just humor Trump. He's gonna he's gonna yeah. do this for a little bit, and then he's gonna golf. And he's gonna leave. He's gonna leave the White House. What what, what are y'all worried about? He's gonna leave. It's amazing how many moments from the last five years you will see resonant in the show. And I have to say, I really think that this show has done better than any show, better than really any piece of entertainment art. Like the job it has done at capturing what it feels like to be in America under this mm-hmm. like era when democracy feels like it's crumbling around us. It's like really incredible and like I spent years at the times trying to convey basically exactly what this show is conveyed in like nine very crisp entertaining hours <laughs> and it like really makes me kind of mad they did they did a good job they did, they did amazing did they're like the way that they cover like institutions and how power broker I was talking to a friend of mine who works in um, a field that is euphemistically called election integrity which mm. means all of the people who were like <laughs> but yeah it's a little scary the like poll watchers and all the like democracy watchdog groups and activist groups and people in state governments and I was like what do folks in your world think of successions treatment of things like election theft and disinformation and all the things that are coming up in the show and she sent me the Leo pointing meme and she was like, everybody is just like, they nailed it. Like, we cannot believe how effectively mm-hmm. they, they nailed did. it. And they a lot of them it. have actually consulted on the show, too. Yeah. Would you say, speaking of reality, how realistic was the Roy's election party? You know, <laughs> on- <laughs> <laughs> I will say on the election, they've done a very good job of making every political scenario quite realistic. That mm-hmm. party... I don't know that uh, the Democratic nominee staff would be at the Fox News election night that party yeah, the that night seemed before. A little off. I, don't, yeah. I don't think I don't think Nate would really uh, would be there. I do one thing that the party captured well. I thought was the sense that all of this is happening in closed rooms with yep. all of these people, this very small number of people who are all maneuvering with like very little mind for the consequences of what happens. And I think you're right that this last episode was the first time that the consequences were starting to impose themselves on the characters who have been have been causing this yeah. for the last four seasons. But it, do, it does capture something that happens a lot in D.C., which is, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats who will be screaming at each other on TV or in the halls of Congress suddenly find themselves at a cocktail party together mm. and they're just like, hey, yeah, it was just, we're friends, we're fine. We you must we're, really miss that. I, yeah, I desperately miss it. That's, that's, that's why I, I went back for the correspondence dinner weekend and, uh, and left a day early. I yeah. miss it so much. <laughs> um, in the past two episodes, we've seen this attempt by uh, the Roy's, brilliant attempt, I, I think, to leverage, you know, the uh, 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 leverage democracy, leverage the country in order to get this Gojo deal killed. How often does horse trading, you know, not of this brilliant magnitude where you're like, I'm going to sell out the country. No, this genius in level. In order to get control of my father's company. Like, that's great. But how often, do, how, how realistic did you find that kind of horse trading? I would say that before the Trump presidency, I would have said, eh, I don't know that it's that obvious right like maybe it's a little more subtle <laughs> but with all the story you know trump's like yeah. handing out pardons and, and rudy's gonna like split the two million dollars right. with him for the right. hell pardons <laughs> and, like jared's doing a deal with the saudis like it's yeah. pretty it seems pretty realistic it's getting yeah it's the art of the deal man yeah and especially like the conversations between that we all saw after the fox defamation suit between like Fox executives and uh, like high-ranking Republicans, like that, that is pretty. That is pretty real. So, when you were in the Obama White House, would the MSNBC executives call you, mm. or who were they calling to <laughs> yeah. like exchange Maddo favors? Would call for... me. Okay, sure. And yeah. I would just put a bag of cash outside my office <laughs> with a big her. dollar sign but, yeah, on the back. Yeah, yeah that and then I would, right. yeah. then I, you know, then she'd air my uh, whatever I want. I'd go on whenever I wanted. <laughs> it would be great. So talking about like important, you know, realities of the day to day, where do you stand on sending blood to your coworkers? <laughs> <laughs> Can I actually tell you guys a story about getting recruited to Crooked Media? It was a few months ago. 
And mm. I got, there was no bags of blood, but I got this call from John, who I knew a little bit. And I picked up the phone. He said, John Favreau. And he said, you know, Max, life isn't nice. It's contingent. <laughs> People who say they love you also fuck you. So this is an explicit <laughs> plan to fuck the pod me rule the world and you can come but it won't be a collaboration you'll be my dog but the scraps from the table will be millions millions and, and he, here he is he was referring to downloads not dollars but i thought it sounded here like a pretty good offer he is i will say that when we first started crooked media we used uh, a random lawyer uh, in in Silicon Valley um, <laughs> to start doing some of our, our contracts with hosts for the first couple of hosts. And you could tell that these were not standard entertainment contracts <laughs> because I th I think that we um, accidentally asked Anna Marie Cox to like um, sign over her uh, the rights to her DNA to us. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Impressive. it was like some kind of a weird yeah. standard like like bio DNA. bio startup contract. Yeah, this is like the she's like I don't think I should sign this? And we're like, well, you know what? We actually do not want that. Is we that don't. what all those cloning booths are that, for in the yeah. back room? Yeah, okay, we got I was, big plans. I was wondering it was in this, those giant tubs of goo this is, and there's this is Anne Marie Cox's. This is our version of Living Plus. <laughs> <is> our... <laughs> uh, do you think that this show has anything... Uh, you mentioned that it really seems to nail the, the texture, the feel of this particular political moment. I wonder if you could uh, expound on that. Well, what particularly are the things that you look at and go, God, that feels like something that either has happened or would happen? I think that uh, ever since Trump, there is a feeling, especially among people, among liberals, among people on the left, that fascists have to necessarily have like carefully laid plans and yeah. coherent ideologies and that that villains are like you know 2d and they're just they're always sitting there plotting about how they're going to take over the world and destroy everything right and in reality i think what succession gets right is this is just a lot of rich powerful mm -hmm. selfish people who are quite nihilistic right. and when you are in positions of power with that much money and you make a bunch of selfish stupid reckless decisions it has it can really fuck up the entire country and yeah. democracy. And you don't have to have a plan to do it. You just have to be as nihilistic as Roman has been, certainly, over the last mm -hmm. couple of days. But in, in reality, all of them. I've been thinking a lot about how this show feels to me like it's kind of in conversation with the like the paranoid thriller movies in the 1970s. You guys know these movies? Mm -hmm. Like Parallax yeah. View yeah. and All the Parallax President's View. Men and the Conversation yeah. and this like all the thrillers that came out after Watergate and Vietnam and kind mm. of like captured this sense that the country had that, you know, democracy was a lie and there were these vast all powerful conspiracies and we're in kind of a similar moment, but Succession's final season feels very different, like you're saying, because um, there's no vast conspiracy. There's no big shadowy plot. And there's also the like 1970s thrillers usually have a protagonist who is like we're seeing who is like fighting back to trying to like protect what's great about America. But the show is so nihilistic and bleak. There's not really good or bad. There's just these like bumbling idiots, basically, yeah. who were like in positions of power and crashing around on each other and like happen to be bringing around these terrifying consequences. And it's like it, it's kind of messed up because there's so much darker than those 70s political thrillers, uh, but their grasp of how things actually work is so much more like mechanistically fine-grained and connect and their yeah. sense of like institutions. And the, the showrunner has like worked on shows in the UK that focus on institutions and bureaucracies. And you like really see it's got like, he's got like a little bit of a political scientist in him. And there was actually, there was a line that Matson had where he was on the phone, he was saying that um, you're not even a real democracy, you're less of a democracy than Botswana because you've been a democracy for 50, 50 years. 50 years, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that is actually a like very specific argument that is really big in political science right now, that the U.S. didn't formally become a democracy until about 50 years ago. And I feel like that must have been a deliberate nod. 
So this argument, if you if you believe this argument, it goes simply because <laughs> women and then people of color had a, we'll call it a difficult time or a touchy time voting for much of the country's history that somehow this wasn't a full-fledged democracy. Is that is that what people are saying in the in the poli size circles? Sorry, air quotes. You're not you're not liking this, are you? I are mean, you, Jared? You're you're just looking for something <laughs> something clean in this polluted land, something not grubby with compromises. <laughs> <laughs> right. I I also That's thought right. they th- I thought they really got right. Like I- at the beginning of the Trump administration, there were a bunch of sort of establishment Republicans who went to go work for Trump and, and yeah. like right. slash former Democrats. You know, uh, mm-hmm. what's his name? Gary, uh, the the finance guy. Who, who's uh, 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 what's his fucking name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, bald guy. Uh, uh, we're going to keep them on the rails. Yeah, We're going to yeah, be yeah. the safeguards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 committee, the committee, the committee yeah, yeah. to save exactly. America. Exactly. Remember the committee right, right, to save America? Right, right. America oh, the adults yeah, in the room? yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Th- those people genuinely believed, right, that uh, I am here because I'm going to have influence over him and I'm going to help stop right. Trump. Mm-hmm. And you can see that in like, Shiv and yeah. Kendall, yeah. right? Remember at Kendall at one point, was he yell- it was another episode yelling at his ex-wife. He's like, you have no idea what I'm trying to do here on s- across seven six continents. continents. Six <laughs> continents. <laughs> yeah, right. kind of, and then Shiv, who is like terrified that Mankin wins, and the very next episode is like, I could impress the Nazi. I could watch. And yeah. my dad Easy. died. My dad died, so I could do anything right now. <laughs> Something this show yeah. really captures that speaks to that, I think, is this sense that not only is nobody coming to rescue, but there's no guardrails. Yeah. There's no safety. Mm-hmm. And that was something that really came through, I thought, in the election night episode where they're just like in the conference room deciding to steal the election. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know about you, but I find that really triggering. Well, and, really and, tough and yeah. Kendall doing a great impression of like m- most people on Wall Street. Be like, the markets will right, reel right, him, right, will yes, rein right, him right, in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, he'll yeah, be yeah, constrained yeah. by the markets yeah. and capitalism and, and the business interests. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of what we do here at Market Moves is about predicting things. You know, even the more liberal X-ray Vision hosts, they predict things. You know, <laughs> for you guys, what do you think the viewers should be looking out for when we come to the finale? How do they land this realistic view of America? What happens? So I have been thinking that perhaps uh, Kendall finally gets his crown, but he's basically... Mm. um, you know, uh, ruling over the ashes <laughs> and mm-hmm. that the whole, that it's not worth uh, being the CEO of this company because, you know, Matson and everything that the kids have done just sort of destroy it somehow. Right. So I've been thinking that's possible. Although I have to say, I am a Market Moves fan, so I've been listening to previous episodes. And <laughs> after watching the last episode, I could see a Greg. I, I know, I know. I it was Greg is the US CEO. I could see it. I could yeah. see Greg is the US CEO. I, I thought it was silly at first, yeah. and now I'm like, yeah. They, that it. tight shot of Matson in the limousine, they're clearly, there's someone who is next to him and like, who else could it be? Yeah. I mean, that was the only person I think who was missing at that point. That would be, that would be something. So I'm really curious what's going to happen with the like, Waystar calling Wisconsin prematurely, which they have set yeah. up for like, that might come mm. back. And that of course, like really parallels like Fox News doing Stop the Steal after mm-hmm. 2020 and the show is like aligning with reality in these ways that are really interesting but i think also make it like an even bigger challenge to land this ship because like fox news doing stop the steal we know now is like really blown up in their face they had to pay an 800 million dollar fine they'll probably pay more they lost tucker carlson they like really lost out but if that happened to waystar yeah. it would kind of ring false for the show's mm. themes so they're in kind of this tricky position and i think like I think we won't know what will happen with Mencken. That's my big prediction if you're really confident uh, uh, about it. I don't think we're going to know what's going to happen with Wisconsin. I don't think we're going to know if I he's going to be president. Right. I don't think we know what's going to happen with this social unrest, which I think is actually really fitting because that's kind of where we are as a country. Yeah. Like we st- like I, a, a, a take that I like to slang occasionally is that like January 6th is an ongoing event and mm. we don't know how mm. it is going to resolve. And I think that the show is like – really landing that message. Mm, that'll help me sleep tonight. <laughs> yeah. Good hard take. Good hard take. Good hard, that's a good hard take, Max. That's a good hard take you gave. Um, here's a, it's something I'm, I'm legitimately interested in. So, you know, the Republicans have been the, uh, the party of uh, business since the late 19th century with the uh, spread of banks and the spread of capitalism. And uh, it was... You know, I think you could argue Bill Clinton embracing capitalism, the creation of neoliberalism after the collapse of the Soviet Union. People realize, oh, this is let's get on board the train and say that we love it. 
Uh, that has it feels like we've parted with that. Uh, certainly, the left electorate hates capitalism now, and they're all uh, they love Marx and they love Mao, and it's ridiculous what's going on. But how do you how do you uh, how do you expect to win without allying with capital? I mean, I, I think that is this a question about the show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great yes. question. But that's why I think that's why I think like. Mencken, right, yeah, is like yeah, so yeah. malleable when when sh- when Shiv and Matson right. are like he's playing maybe both, yeah. maybe don't block the deal, right? Yeah, yeah. right, right. You and know, he's and with then the big he, Swedish tech he, company. like yeah. fascists don't really care for like capitalism or yeah. not. They yeah. just they want to just con- they want to con- they want control, right? But they I mean want that's, the, and that's power. the whole DeSantis thing, right? Is right. He's, he's going after the right. big corporations because they think that's going to be useful foil for him. And now Disney is the hero of the resistance, which yeah. is a little bit of a weird position to be in. It's all it's all in the service of power. So I think that's how they. That's true. Yeah, that does actually align pretty well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the answer to your question is nothing matters. Yes. It's all power and money, <laughs> nihilism, nihilism. Yeah. It's like politics. Nihilism, it's, all, it's all money and gossip. Are it's you happy you had a song? <laughs> uh, I'm happy in the sense that uh, you know I understand now that um, there's nothing to fear from you guys. We've got it. Uh, the market moves side is on the right side of history, money ascendant, uh, Jared Mick in 2024. Uh, we're going all the way. We love it. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank and you. And good luck on good luck on your on your side of things. Thank yeah, you. Uh, thank you for having us. Good luck. Good luck out there on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I we fly only helicopters now. Good. We don't oh, only helicopters. Course, only yeah, yeah. Private. Yeah. Private. Okay. We'll see you in the skies. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 